Good morning, good evening, and wherever the sun may find you, my name is Walt, and this is Coffee and Concepts on Keystroke Medium. It seems like we were just here not five minutes ago. Uh, we had uh, two shows last week. Um, we were playing on uh, and playing around with uh, uh, our time schedule because uh, the rest of the Keystroke crew had the week off. So we figured we'd fill in where we could. Now that uh, everybody seems to be back to work, we're, uh, uh, we're, uh, we're going to go back to our regular schedule. Uh, Joaquim Oliveira, uh, bon dia, sir. Uh, he's saying good morning, guys. Mernon. Uh, so uh, today, uh, we're going to start off by talking about a French press coffee. So if you don't know what this is, um, French press is, uh, it's a, uh, usually a glass carafe, uh, enclosed by, uh, metal rings with, uh, a little handle going on. Uh, da, da. We're going to go like that. Uh, there we go. Good. All right. So uh, like I said, uh, it's got metal rings that support the glass and uh, usually got a cool little handle. Um, and uh, you got noticed that uh, very conspicuous plunger on the top. So you pour the coffee in the bottom, uh, add some water, and then press the plunger. It's got a, a metal screen. You press the plunger, and it uh, screens all the grounds to the bottom, and uh, you pour it out. So in an ideal world, uh, first of all, in an ideal world, we say, uh, part of today, hey, Walt, <laughs> we say, hello, uh, uh, my former pastor had one of those, used it for tea. Yeah, you could definitely use it for tea. Uh, let's see, Facebook user, I use my French press every morning. I'm going to have to stroll over to Facebook and figure out who Facebook user is, but that's okay. We can do that. We have the techno robbery. Um, so yeah, in, a, in an ideal world uh, with the French press, you, uh, let's see, Tyler Davis is our Facebook user. Hey, Tyler, uh, saw you on the show yesterday, man. Good deal. Um, so uh, in an ideal world, you're going to take the coffee grounds, you're going to put them in the bottom of the uh, of the French press, uh, you're going to use uh, some nice boiling water, throw that in there, uh, and you're going to let this sit for four minutes. Now, there's a couple of different ways people use this, these French presses. Um, they uh, uh, Some people preheat the glass. They'll either put it in, submerge it in warm water to keep the inside dry, uh, like in a sink or something like that, or uh, some people will actually pour warm water in it, pour it out, um, dry it off real quick, and then add the coffee grounds water, so forth and so on. But you really want to let this hang out for about four minutes. Um, it gives the water enough time to soak up all of the, uh, all of the groovy coffee juice. Um, uh, you know, sits in the, in the ground so that uh, the ground sit in the water, excuse me, and allows uh, that good coffee oil and, and all those flavors to kind of coalesce into the water. And then at, at about four minutes, it's got like a little plunger on top, you push it down, the screen pushes the grounds all the way to the bottom. And some people have their preferences. Uh, some camps say pour the uh, entire contents of the French press out. Uh, so that it doesn't continue to uh, kind of allow the water to continue to pull those oils from the coffee grounds. Uh, and then some people just don't care and they leave it in there and it just, you know, whether it gets stronger or more bitter, they just do, they just allow it that way. And then they just pour right from the press. Um, I've done both. Uh, so it, you know, I mean, uh, and they are correct. It will continue to extract some of the oils from the coffee grind. So, you know, you might get uh, a shot of coffee later that is a little more than you bargained for, but, you know, um, play with it as you can. But the most important thing about or aspect about this whole process is the time involved. For a really good cup of coffee out of a French press, you want a good uh, four minutes um, at least. Some people split the time. You know, they add a little bit of water and then they uh, they add uh, they 30 to 90 seconds of just letting it hang out at the bottom, just kind of that initial base reaction of the water to the uh, to the coffee grounds. And then some people, uh, you know, some people, oh, the boss is here. Hey, oh, 
Josh Hayes. Uh, and then uh, um, we have another guy. I use flavored coffee, and I like to leave it in. I, I assume that is Mr. Tyler Davis. Uh, yep, it is. Groovy, groovy, right? And uh, so really that time is what you're, is what you're going for. Uh, you're going for that time of uh, the four-minute press of leaving everything in so that um, it has enough time to kind of do what it needs to do and present you with a good cup of coffee. And that brings us to our concept for the day. And uh, that concept is uh, setting your novel in different time periods. Uh, now, we're not talking about setting it in the very far future uh, where we don't know what it's like going to be like or setting it so far uh in the past that we don't have a frame of reference to actually research it um uh and we're definitely not talking about um uh, <laughs> corvo uh my former pastor used to fight vampires checkmate <laughs> did he do it with a french press that's the important part. Uh, so, um, so we're talking about, um, you, you know, we're not talking about setting uh, your novel in like a fantasy realm or someplace that might not have a frame of reference, but in a historical setting, you're setting that novel um, in a period where, uh, for the most part, you have access to somebody who knows exactly what things were like back then. So, what are a couple of different things you can do to kind of cement yourself in that setting and and try and get as historically accurate as possible well as with all things books uh first thing you should do uh, or, or all things uh uh you know setting wise all, the first thing you should do is research so um grab a bunch of books in the subject uh that's a great place to start and give you can give you a frame of reference um look across the net uh find some uh some people who are, are considered experts in those fields and kind of read their thoughts on the subject uh, or on the time period, uh, really get you going. Uh, another thing, documentaries. Um, uh, World War One and Living Color came out a few years ago, um, where they they colorized a whole bunch of like footage and stuff like that, and just really blew people away as as far as like the feel and the breadth of what that particular time period was. Um, they have done the same thing to World War Two war footage that were just absolutely stunning and, and really kind of shocked people because it took that kind of, you know, uh, that, that layer of separation that the black and white footage had. And, uh, it was like, you know, instead of this is what 1920s, blah, 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 or 1940s, you know, uh, the attack looked like and blah, 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 you know, instead of it being so separated, it was, that sense of color and depth and and kind of high definition that we've come to expect with our world today uh due to our technology it brought things kind of into that perspective um <laughs> part of today might help to track down bill and i assume that's supposed to be uh ted and yes do some literal time travel uh if you do that video or it didn't happen um so uh you know that's a good place the research is a really good place to start um, and, and grab um, uh, grab as much information on that setting as you can. Uh, uh, but then, you know, take it to the next level. Um, if it's within your lifespan or within the lifespan of somebody who might have interacted with somebody that uh, kind of encapsulates that time period, uh, talk to folks who were around at the time. Um, luckily, there are, and there are very few left, uh, you know, and, and it is dwindling day by day, but there are still people around who were part of World War II. Um, there were still, there are uh, tons of Vietnam vets. Um, and uh, although it might seem like I gravitate toward the wars that we fought in the last 50 to 100 years, uh, um, one of the things that, um, big conflicts do is it kind of encapsulates a time period. So, um, you know, tracking down those people and, and who are a part of those events, um, it, usually those events are very uh, traumatic and very uh, exciting, not exciting in a fun way, but exciting as in like, oh my God, that really happened, you know, uh, and, and those uh, events are very easy to track. Uh, big things like uh, walking on the moon. Um, Athon Books uh, has their alternate history. Uh, lunar, uh, uh, the lunar missile crisis. Um, uh, 
where they're in 1960s, uh, hey, William Joseph Roberts, uh, they're in 1960s um, um, kind of like that whole atmosphere when all of a sudden they encounter aliens, you know, and what would that do to the timeline? What would that do to, uh, you know, uh, all of the events of that, the Cold War spr uh, sprouting up? Uh, how would that change things? Um, so, uh, but they have, uh, you know, th that sense of time is there and uh, you can definitely tell there was a lot of research that went into things. Um, but uh, yeah, find people who were around at the time and kind of uh, say, hey, you know, would you mind talking about this thing? Or you could go to um, a subject matter expert, uh, such as Professor Art T. Burton, who was on the writer's journey and did uh, a fantastic job of uh, debuting some of the, the historical figures of the time and uh, who were like uh, in and around cowboy days, uh, especially certain marshals. Uh, I don't know what that means. <laughs> Joaquin Oliveira, Burma, uh, please clarify. Uh, so yeah, definitely find folks who were either around at the time or um, who are subject matter experts on those time periods and, and kind of pick their brain a little bit. Uh, another great avenue to pursue, uh, antique stores or museums. Um, older thing, things have a very usually tactile feel. Um, even even uh, mundane items uh, kind of were built to withstand harsher conditions than we have today. Um, you know, uh, your coffee maker, your little French press that you have that's made of like tempered glass with a little steel frame and the little wire press, you know, aren't like those field coffee pots that you had in the, uh, what was the book? that you were just talking about that was set in the 60s. Oh, <laughs> um, I will have to bring that link up for you. Um, but the, um, uh, what do you call it? The, uh, uh, you know, the, those items in the, uh, it, those items in the, uh, in the past were usually pretty good about, um, withstanding harsher conditions because we had less technology we had less things that kind of helped us survive in places so things had a tendency to be built a little more sturdy so um you know you go to like an antique shop and you see like an old an, an old coffee kettle you know from back in the in like settlers days or um you know thick woven rugs that had uh uh, you know, that had, you could tell it was uh, stitched and thatched by hand. Um, uh, old muskets and, and um, uh, I used to collect uh, really old weaponry. And one of the things I, I always enjoyed was getting my hands on like an older blade, you know, something that was from the early uh, mid or late 1800s that it's withstood the test of time. And, um, you know, I, I managed to get myself a very, very, very old tomahawk, and uh, it, it. I mean, you you picked it up, and you just you felt this sense of history from it. So, uh, same thing for museums. Going to museums like um, uh, the uh, museums in Washington D.C. or uh, the museums in New York, and you know, just walk in there and get a sense of the history take a look at some of those items and, and how they uh, interacted with the people of the time. Um, you know, uh, one, one of my favorite things to do, go into, and I get yelled at, uh, not, it, not yelled, but like, excuse me, please don't do that, sir. You know, you go into a store and you see an antique typewriter. You know, for those kids watching today, uh, a typewriter is like a keyboard where paper comes out and your wordy words come on the paper. It's ancient technology. So, um, you know, but the, the tactile feel of the clickety clack of you actually having to depress a key and force that, that key to strike a ribbon to imprint on a piece of paper. I mean, that was, that was some pretty cool stuff. Um, so yeah, find those, those either museums or, or antique stores, which won't get you yelled at at all. I'm sure experiment uh, and find uh, find some things that uh, that uh, might have been around from that time period and kind of get some hands on to it and and see what those things are like another thing for uh, that is a really good resource that we have today because you know 
first world, uh, uh, a resource for setting your novel in a different time period, uh, reenactment communities. Um, there are tons of these all over the place, um, reenacting Civil War battles, reenacting World War II battles, uh, reenacting antique communities. Um, so you have uh, in certain sections of the East Coast, uh, you have the Amish uh, who will allow certain members or certain, they have certain areas where visitors can come in and check out uh, an older lifestyle. Um, uh, you know, woodworking and, uh, um, uh, uh, you know, I, I remember uh, visiting a, um, a Plymouth Rock, like settler community in Massachusetts as a reenactment community, and they showed you how to churn butter. So you had this like this big stick set into a, a bucket with a cover and it was it, you were just, you know, ramming this stick up and down to force uh, you know, the milk fat to turn into butter. Uh, it was, it was pretty neat as a kid. Um, uh, Joaquin saying, uh, history channel has great docs. You know, there's a resource right there for documentaries, you know, uh, just see what else you can do. Uh, lots of that around here in Chickamauga battlefield. All right. Right. Civil war type stuff, right. Reenactment communities, uh, like, uh, that the settler communities, uh, that they had in Plymouth, Massachusetts. Um, now, Ren Fair is a hit or miss, right? A Renaissance Fair can be a hit or miss if you're looking for that kind of time period. And and here's the problem that you have with Ren Fairs today. Um, uh, movies, popular fiction, uh, the proliferation of Dungeons and Dragons. Um, people mistake Ren Fair or Renaissance Fair for uh, medieval and before time periods. So we have gone to Renaissance fairs. Uh, we have the King Richard's fair, or we had the King Richard's fair before all this nastiness hit, um, up here in, uh, up in, uh, my neighboring state of Massachusetts. Um, and you'd walk in there and there would be this barbarian with like giant skulls and a, and an ax that if it was real would not be able to be even lifted by a human being. Um, uh, you know, with goblins around, uh, you know, people painted up to be like goblins around him. And it's like, that's not, no, <laughs> that's fiction. That's not uh, Renaissance style living. Um, so, uh, and then uh, the latest trend, which seems to be catching on. And I don't know people who are Star Trek fans cosplaying as Star Trek um, like away teams to uh, visit these communities and, and yelling out, you know, prime directive and don't, you know, don't influence the culture. And it's so <laughs> the immersion that you might have had uh, with uh, Renaissance culture um, might not be something that you're going to encounter if you go to a rent fair and some of these, these fringe communities decide to visit dressed up as whatever. So, um, hit or miss, but you know, the plus side of going to a Renaissance fair and seeing these things, um, you can pick up Renaissance age tools and equipment and weapons and check out their heft and what they felt like and, um, how to actually, uh, you know, certain things like weaving, um, uh, textiles together and, and stuff like that. So that, that kind of that kind of feel can still be had at most Renaissance fairs. Uh, you know, watching a blacksmith work. Um, you know, eat, eating uh, traditionalized foods. Uh, there's always beer. Uh, you know, so that can help a lot. So these reenactment communities uh, uh, can and uh, uh, museum style uh, reenactments can can really go a long way to kind of immerse you into that time period. So there's just a couple of things that if you're looking to create uh, a story set in a different time period that you can use to um, kind of uh, uh, get yourself into the right uh, frame and into the right uh, into the right uh, kind of headspace so that you can write those scenes and write those uh, those things. Oh my God, beer and scotch and eggs. Mm. <laughs> way to go, William Joseph Roberts. Uh, 
So uh, he had a good point, actually. Uh, and when you can't go visit places like that, you can still do those things, making butter, soap, things you can do hands-on to get a sense of what it takes. Oh, hell yeah. Um, uh, so yeah, do some research, find out what those techniques are and try and duplicate them and see, you know, how difficult it was back then before, you know, Amazon. And speaking of Amazon, um, uh, Joaquin Oliveira was saying, what was that book you were just talking about that was set in the sixties? So we have, uh, the Luna missile crisis and it's from our friends over at Athon books. Um, you can find this on Amazon right now, uh, Kindle audiobook. Uh, they have it in hardcover. You can even get an audio CD. Um, so it takes place in 1961, uh, cold war is going on. And, uh, uh, what ends up happening is, uh, during a manned space flight, they encounter aliens. <laughs> so <laughs> my wife's in the other room, like, Woo! Um, so, um, yeah, what happens when humans, uh, discover aliens and there could be some underlying evil that kind of mires everything up, but that's on, uh, that's on Amazon right now. So if you want to check it out, uh, Joaquin, uh, uh, we'll make sure we put links into the show notes and, uh, and we'll make sure that we put, uh, links into the writer's journey, uh, where, uh, they talk to, uh, professor Burton. And, uh, yeah, we'll go from there. But, uh, yeah, if you got any ideas about how you've researched a historical uh, fiction piece, please put them in the comments below. We'd love to hear them and uh, pass them on to folks who might be interested in doing the same thing. So uh, don't forget, Scott, Josh, and Chuck on Monday mornings uh, live on Keystroke Medium. Uh, we have, uh, obviously, Coffee and Concepts. Normally 7.30. I was a little late getting home. Uh, on Tuesday mornings, uh, and then uh, the writer's journey on Thursday nights. That's at uh, 9 p.m. Eastern uh, with Lauren and Kayleen, where they dissect um, kind of subjects like this, where you know it gives authors a leg up and a, and a step in the right direction to getting into their writing journey uh, with uh, clever guests and a lot of uh, fanfare. So we also have um, on the YouTube channel uh, Josh guy you doing long form interviews uh you can check that out so uh don't forget we have uh keystroke coffee uh and a lot of things going on at keystrokemedium.com right now so if you can get your get your groove on by going that way and uh find out what the keystroke crew is up to I totally did not mean to rhyme like that, but uh, they just revamped the website. So uh, if you get a second, head on over, check them out. Um, you, Keystroke Coffee is live. So um, we uh, uh, we got the Keystroke stuff going. Lots of good blends. Uh, if you're on the Facebook group, I was on there the other day and uh, I did an unboxing or an unbagging of uh, Keystroke Coffee, a light on story, which is their light roast. Uh, very good coffee. I, I just, I mean, just alone, you know, cracking open that bag, the smell was amazing. So um, it was, it was a lot of fun to tear into. Um, let's see, we have uh, uh, another uh, thing from William Joseph Roberts, spend time making charcoal. That is a chore and was extremely dangerous profession at one time. Uh, we don't want to recommend anybody doing something that's dangerous. So, you know, consult a subject matter expert. <laughs> Uh, Joaquin saying thanks for ob obviously uh, sending out that book link. And uh, so with that, um, get yourself into some coffee, do some reading, some writing, and maybe some things in between right here on Keystroke Medium. Thanks, folks. Have a great morning. And there's